So what you seem to have identified then as like the undercurrent to all this in your article is that um, that superstructure, if you will, has made death not a privation, but a good. That's right. It's, it's made it a positive choice that's rather right. than something that's um, it doesn't have existence in and of itself, but it's merely the lack of another thing. That's right. Because because th th death is is a privation of the precondition or the precondition which is life, uh, and and so and that's the the moral structure that we've often thought about death within is that it is a privation, and that's a long tradition in Christian thought for for, for evil and death to be thought of primarily as privation. Right? It's, you find it as early as Saint Augustine, for instance. Um, and so 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 so. What we've done is we've turned it from something that was a privation into a good, and that fundamentally reframes all of our choices in medicine in, in, in a way. And I, and I point to a particularly a fascinating article published in 1998 by a, a philosopher of jurisprudence, Martha Minow, who made this case way back in 1998, uh, how by turning it into a good, it fundamentally reframes all choices in medicine, even all choices in our culture. So th this is like an uh, almost in a way a, a version of iconoclasm, where uh, the the West has now taken and turned its its destructive sites on the human person as an image of God. I mean, I, actually, I, I want to rephrase that. It's because we don't view the human person as the image of God that we feel so comfortable discarding it when it's inconvenient, when we lack utility, when when there's a minor struggle. Like the, the example from Canada you mentioned, that fellow wasn't even subject to a terminal illness. It was just a disability that, as you pointed out, would have been easily worked around, supported. And yet, here we are. So we're, we're militating against the givenness of the body. We're militating against something that um, it, it really gets to our identity in a certain way. So, so one way to one way to put it, and you you touched on the language of icon and iconoclasm. What one way to put it is, in, insofar, what one way to put it, if we say that we are an icon of of the God, uh, if we say we are made in the image of likeness of God, one way of saying that is that we are icons of the divine, right? And insofar as we're icons of the divine, then something something deep is revealed about personhood, right? So theologically speaking, we're something about God is being revealed in persons, right? And that, that's kind of what that means when we say that we're made in the image and likeness of God. But even if you don't take a theological position on that, there is something about the human being that remains ineffable even to a secular mindset. And uh, and you when you when you when you uh, when you create these kind of perverse structures that uh, foreclose on something mysterious being revealed, then it the culture itself becomes iconoclastic in this in this very dark sense. Because if the human is an icon of the divine, and iconoclasts will destroy icons, <laughs> uh, then this modern culture can be seen as a destroyer of icons. Well, what I, what I would say, you said something that's really, I think is really important. And, and it's that in, uh, you know, in, in thinking that our utilitarian calculus can name all the goods possible, mm. we think we enact the good when we sum it up. What that forecloses on is for goods that don't fit inside that calculus to come to the forefront. And what what so 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 even the utilitarian thinking itself presumes that all the possible goods are known. The greatest good for the greatest number of people. We act like we already know what the goods are, and yet oh. li living beings surprise us all the time. Um, and so it, and we and like like for instance, you know, we we think we know. Somebody thinks, okay, let's just take another example, and we'll deploy a utilitarian calculus on it. Let's just talk about deciding uh, to get married. We imagine that we know all the good things that are going to happen and all the bad things that are going to happen, and we're just going to add them up at the end of the day, and we're going to have a net good, and therefore I should marry this person. 
I don't know about you, but I found out a lot of negative things about myself when I got married. I found out how selfish I was. I found out how self-absorbed I was. I found out all these other really uh, not so good or savory things about myself. But then I also found out that my wife could surprise me and that she could challenge me to become even better than I thought I was capable of being, right? So utilitarian calculus, it, uh, it forecloses on us imagining other goods that are possible that 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 because we think we've named them all okay uh and and so so in living and even in dying we think we're going to just add it up and we get the net a net result and we foreclose on what would have been possible in the creativity of our living because even the dying even a dying person is still living in the creativity of our living into our death some other good might come forth that we had not imagined as a possibility. Ladies and gents, the preview is over. To watch the full video, go to canon211.locals.com and become a member, become a supporter, get access to exclusive content, stay in touch with the Canon211 community. Well, that's it for today. Never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori. Cheers. <laughs>